Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Swami, uh, Swami Sivasubramanian. You don't have to remember my last name. Uh, even Polly might have difficulty saying it, although it does not. So that was one of my launch criteria. So I basically manage uh, AI for AWS. So all the services that we announced today and various uh, deep learning engine innovative capabilities that uh, we have announced and so forth. So basically what I want to do today is uh, talk about uh, the three new services uh, that we have announced today. And we will have two customers uh, come in and talk about like, how they use these services to push the envelope on what it means to build intelligent applications for their respective use cases. So very excited to showcase some of the innovative things what our customers have done, and even more excited to see what are all the things you all are going to be doing with these services. So let's get right to it. So in Amazon, if you go back uh, 20 years, you can Google right now to see Amazon Virtuous Cycle. We talk about, like, Jeff Bezos literally wrote it in a napkin, saying, like, hey, more selection of uh, products leads to more customers. More customers needs to actually us being able to bring our costs down, which means we can actually list more selections and whatnot. When, and I've been at AWS since the beginning when AWS was probably one-tenth the size of uh, um, this room or something like that. And uh, having built 20-yard cloud computing services, we always talk about flywheel for data. So we live in a world now where we collect lots of data. I mean, every kind of data, and we want to analyze them. And then after analyzing them, we want to actually use them to build better products. Better products leads to more users, and this leads to more data. To get more data, what kind of data do we collect? So all the way from clickstream, user activity, and then uh, purchases, and so forth. And in AWS, we provide different kinds of tools. We have tools like object storage, uh, like our S3, our relational databases, non-relational databases, streaming analytics, BI, and so forth. All these tools, and the newly announced Athena and so forth, all these tools basically help us to analyze what products actually work, what features do our customers like and don't like, what can we actually uh, understand about our customer behavior. And once we analyzed it, we actually want to do something about it. So that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So our goal here is to build and enable new set of applications that has intelligence ingrained in them. We want to be able to enable developers to build a new class of applications that can hear, speak, see, and understand humans and environment around us. That's kind of the Uber mission for what our services do. So when you look at actually, I mean, Andy just touched on it uh, in, a, in his keynote today. So in Amazon, we have been doing AI for a long time. So this is, uh, I think, around 1996, when Amazon.com was only doing books. And uh, you can see the logo. We didn't even have the new logo. This is literally the Amazon River running through A, so, and so forth. And we had like a million books listed. So during even that time when we were trying to figure out what it means to run an e-commerce site and how do you scale a website, we already had a uh, machine learning driven recommendation engine. That's what we mean by eyes. And we had editors also curating it. So this is literally like 20 years ago when machine learning was not considered cool. Now it is the actually biggest thing. So in Amazon, we have thousands of uh, machine learning, deep learning, and AI researchers working on various things. All the way from discovery and search, we use various machine learning, deep learning techniques. And in our fulfillment centers, we actually um, got to a point where the amount of packages we had to ship, it was becoming so enormous that we had to deploy robotics and deep learning-based computer vision models to find out what is the best way to fulfill a customer order. And then enhancing existing products. If you have used any of our devices, you will see X-ray vision. I mean, that's actually really cool technology that, again, uses various deep learning techniques and computer vision models as well. And the final, I mean, the other one is Amazon um, Alexa, which is, I think, something is blinking here. So, 
I mean, uh, Alexa. Alexa is, uh, defines a new category of products. I mean, I have a uh, two-year-old daughter. She talks to Alexa like it's a real person. Uh, I mean, she says, play wheels on the bus, and she just talks to it directly. She doesn't even have to pick up a phone anymore to click on play a song or whatnot. So my goal is to enable uh, and bring machine learning to every AWS developer, millions of AWS developers. And even before the services that we announced today, we have various customers running AI workloads on us. Zillow uh, uses deep learning using uh, various things like Apache Spark to estimate what they call a Z-estimate. We have Fendra who talked about uh, using machine learning to do various things like anomaly detection and so forth. And Netflix uh, blogged about how they are using deep learning engine on top of AWS to do recommendation. And the other cool one, which uh, you might have seen in yesterday's James Hamilton's demo was too simple, which uses MXNet, uh, our own deep learning engine framework uh, that we have collaborated with uh, CMU and other top universities. And they have built an, uh, one of the best autonomous driving deep learning model. I mean, that exists in the industry as well. So you might be wondering, like, what is all this buzz around deep learning? I mean, when you look at it, it's not really a new technology, although every blog that uh, talks about it writes as if it was just invented like three years ago. But if you look at the industry, it has been around probably for 30 years if you talk to AI researchers. If you talk to mathematicians, they will say it has been around for 50 years, so depending on who you believe. But what actually made it suddenly more applicable to us? And this is where few things actually, uh, a confluence of factors actually came about. One is that we live in a world where we are able to collect huge amount of data. And deep learning algorithms really love data. They really want, are hungry for data, and the more data you feed it, it's better. So thanks to cloud and all the storage solutions like S3 and um, all our relational, non-relational, and Snowball, and now with Snowmobile, we are able to, I mean, pump a lot of data to the cloud. And uh, with this data, you have to process them. Deep learning actually involves some complex mathematical operations. And these things require specialized hardware. And that's where the availability of these uh, GPUs and accelerated hardware comes in. So now that we have GPUs available in the cloud, so I as a developer or data scientist or machine learning practitioner can actually um, have a click of a button and deploy these algorithms, you are able to make it more accessible. But the final factor that goes into it is programming models. You don't have to be a deep specialist in deep learning to actually start using these algorithms. Now these come with programming models. You can even build it with uh, various popular programming models like now Python and various other things. So suddenly we are, these algorithms are becoming more and more accessible. And in AWS, and this is uh, even a month before, we launched AWS Deep Learning Army, which is, uh, you can run it on P2 GPU instances or our CPU instances, and uh, we support all the popular deep learning engine, uh, MXNet, TensorFlow, Tiano, Cafe, Torch, and whatnot. So, and these come pre-configured with uh, GPU drivers and so forth. So, our goal is to do one-click GPU-based or CPU-based deep learning uh, infrastructure where you can actually uh, run through and build a deep learning model trained across millions of images by training across 100 GPUs. You don't have to provision uh, them and actually set up all this cluster. We have a cloud formation template that lets you do that. So in addition to that, another cool innovation, this is something we are exposing for various ML practitioners and deep learning practitioners. If you are a data scientist, very excited about building your own deep learning models to do self-driving cars or skin cancer research or so forth, you probably want the best deep learning engine that exists where you can throw in as much data as you want, but you still want to build a deep learning model in a matter of hours instead of having to wait for days. So 
One of the things what um, we asked our team to do is saying like, let's go scale, I mean, run benchmarks across every deep learning framework that exists and find out which one scales out the best. And uh, I'm very passionate about scale out because I built DynamoDB, which is, uh, I mean, has unlimited, virtually unlimited scale with respect to databases. And we want to be able to build the equivalent of incremental scalability for deep learning where as your data set continues to increase, you want to throw more and more boxes, and then it just gets near linear scalability. We found that MXNet to be one of the most uh, scalable deep learning framework, um, where you're getting almost like 109x speed up on 128 GPUs. I mean, that's incredible speed up. But yesterday, we also announced the, uh, and benchmark that you can actually go download and try it out yourselves on MXNet. Uh, Cafe, TensorFlow, and so forth, so that you can pick the right tool for your job. But again, you might be wondering, like, all these requires a company, a startup, or an enterprise to have PhDs in machine learning and deep learning to actually add intelligence to these applications. I mean, that's not going to be the model that scales. So we asked ourselves, saying, like, how can we help customers put intelligence at the heart of every application and business. That's how we took a step back and say, hey, we had to build intelligent services for app developers that are powered by deep learning. And uh, that's how we built these various services, Amazon Poly, Recognition, and Lex. So Amazon Poly, as uh, you will see, it's a text-to-lifelike speech service and recognition is a deep learning based uh, image analysis and facial analysis service. And Amazon Lex is our conversational engine, which is at the heart of Alexa. So let's take a look at each of them quickly. Amazon Lex. So when you look at actually, before we get into Amazon Lex, one of the things, uh, when you look at how humans have interacted with computers, we have gone through various generations of how our interaction with computers have been. The first generation of uh, has been like machines were very expensive and uh, almost humans work for the machines to make them work for us. We had to actually build or print these punch cards and actually key them in during these old days. And these were machine-oriented interactions where we had to work hard to enable these machines to do the computation. And then things got better we move to control-oriented interactions, where we click, we swipe, and then um, uh, we use mouses and so forth, and point and whatnot. This is basically to say, hey, I want to do all these things, so I'm going to click through like 10 different buttons or type in various um, things and so forth to accomplish what I want to do. Now, the next generation, is what we call as intent-oriented communication, where if I'm trying to book a flight, I don't have to go through like 10 different clicks before I actually go book a flight. I just want to say, I want to book a flight. It's the equivalent of like, I keep going back to my two-year-old daughter. She gets annoyed now if a TV is not Alexa enabled. She just looks at the TV and say, Alexa, TV off. And she wants it to be off. And uh, we are moving to a world where we, are, we expect things to be intent-oriented communication with computers. That's where Lex comes in. So Lex is an AWS service that enables you to build voice and text chatbots. It is the same automatic speech recognition and natural language understanding engine that powers Alexa. And the other thing we have done with Lex is that uh, we wanted to make it super easy for you to build these bots and deploy it on various frameworks like Facebook, Slack, and so forth. And it's not just for consumer scenario. Imagine, let's say, you're an enterprise and you have a backend with various enterprise SaaS vendors. And uh, you want to actually ask queries like, what are the top 10 sales leads that are not closed today? You can write a simple Lambda function to your Salesforce backend so that your sales people could literally have a mobile app where they speak to it saying like, what are my top 10 sales leads? It's going to be as simple as that. So that's what Lex is about. Now let me just walk through a quick example 
of uh, what uh, we did in the morning with a bit more detail of what this does. So as we said uh, in the morning, so imagine you're trying to book a flight. To book a flight, you need basically only three things, like what is the origin, destination, and departure date. So you start out with saying like, hey, book a flight to London. And then we run through our automatic speech recognition, which recognizes, hey, these are the three things. And then we send it to our natural language understanding, which extracts the intent and then says, hey, these are the things the customer is trying to actually fulfill. And we call them like slot filling. We actually fill it in the relevant slots and parameters. And then say, hey, London Heathrow is an airport, and that's the destination the customer is trying to do. So now that we filled it, we actually have a choice. We integrate with uh, our mobile SDKs and Cognito, where you can actually use it to determine the location, assuming you have GPS turned on. Or you can configure legs to go back and ask the customer, saying, like, where are you flying from? And based on that, let's say it is from Seattle, then the only thing remaining is you, we had to ask the customer, saying, like, what is the departure date? Again, I, as a developer, I can configure legs to say, ask this question, saying, like, when would you like to fly? Or what time do you want to fly? You can configure it, and we will use Polly to ask back the question to the customer. And then they say, next Friday, we have a uh, context of our engine, again, with our knowledge graph and so forth, that understands that, hey, next Friday means, let's say, 1118. And then you can, once these slots are filled, you can talk about, like, you can hook it up to a Lambda function that gets triggered. Imagine if you have a uh, microservice that does uh, flight booking running on AWS. Now, all you need to do is like type in a few phrases in the console, hook it up to a Lambda function, and now you have the equivalent of your own Alexa-style experience for your application. That's basically what Lex enables you to do. Then you respond back that your flight is booked. So now, imagine if you're a travel company. You say, hey, I like to book flights, but I also want my customers to be able to book hotels. You do a similar thing. Now you can actually chain these intents, saying like, if a customer book for flights, they would like to chain these intents and actually book for hotels too. So you can start uh, chaining these intents and then ask the customer, would you like to book a hotel today? And then if they say yes, we will lead them to the next set of intents they would like to fill. So that's Lex in a nutshell. Again, the philosophy behind Amazon AI services, and this is true for Lex, is high quality, best in class deep learning service with deep functionality. And it's easy to use and integrated well. So this is what we mean by integrated with Lambda, Cognito, Mobile Hub, and DynamoDB, and so forth. So that's Lex. Now let's look at Poly. So Poly is our lifelike speech service. It converts text into speech. It's fully managed. We support 24 languages and 47 voices. And it's suited for not just offline uh, text-to-speech conversion, but it's also for, it's a low-latency, real-time uh, service. Now let's hear from Polly. Of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do, once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So this is the first paragraph from Alice in Wonderland, for folks you probably be wondering. So that's an example of like what a lifelike speech, literally feeding a text from a book, sounds like. Now you might be wondering, so, OK, that was good, but let's unpack what happens in each of it with a few examples. One of the first examples that Andy showed today was like an example of a weather. It is not just automatic text processing, but it's also accurate. Where you Today say, in Seattle, Washington, it's 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Where we understand WA means Washington. The second one is actually more We live for the music live from the Madison Square Garden. So if you look at this text, the word live and live is spelled the same. But the engine understands the context of these things. So it has contextual awareness, 
built using deep learning models so that it knows when to say love, when to say live. Now, the second one is that Polly is intelligent um, and intelligible. So let's take a look at an example. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? How many of you want to challenge Polly in this one? <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, uh, this shows the power of what a well-trained deep learning model can actually do with respect to being able to generate speech dynamically. The third one is there are cases where a text has a semantic meaning. For instance, um, somebody actually edited the slides, but imagine if you're displaying a telephone number where Richard's number is 2,122,341,237. Clearly, somebody was trying to tell a telephone number, but then without semantic meaning, we were actually reading it out like a number. But I, as a developer, can annotate it to be a telephone number to make it sound like... Richard's number is 212-234-1237. So that's much better. Now, again, these are actually done through, I mean, uh, well-standardized markup languages where you can tell Polly, hey, read things this way. My last name is Nguyen. My last name is Nguyen. This is another example of like, I have a very tough name, and there are very similar hard names to be pronounced, which has customized pronunciation in different languages. So again, you can actually configure Polly using uh, markup languages so that you can tweak how they get spelled. That is Polly in a nutshell. Again, the philosophy with Polly is the same as like what we did in Lex. It's a high quality, best in class deep learning system with deep functionality and easily integrated. And one of the uni unique things about Poly is that we have made sure that developers do not, um, we don't put any restrictions. You, as a developer, can actually convert the speech, I mean, text to speech, and cache it offline. You can store it offline and use it however often. You don't have to call back Poly to generate the text every time. So we don't impose any restrictions on usage. Now let's take a look at recognition. So recognition is our image recognition and facial analysis service that enables you to search and understand visual content. So we do various things like object and scene detection, where imagine this is a picture you're building, let's say, um, something like um, a property listing app. Now you have a property where you can actually run it through recognition. We recognize that, hey, this one, uh, this property has a swimming pool, and it has a garden with a nice backyard and trees and so forth. So imagine if one of your customers want to say, only show me houses that has a swimming pool and a garden. Now you can actually enable that visual search without having to have your real estate agents annotate these images and so forth. This is going to be way more accurate. So now, we also do facial analysis. Let's take a, this example. With this face, we are able to get demographic data, which is really important if you are building, let's say, I mean, advertising or personalization platform. And we can also recognize the sentiments, whether the person is happy, are they smiling or frowning or so forth, and also various other facial features as well. And this facial analysis in addition to that, we can also do comparison. For example, we can say, hey, are these two images the same? And in addition to just comparing, we can also we give you a confidence interval of like, hey, there is a 94% chance this, these are the same photos. Even for me, first time, I had to double check with my team, is this really the same person? And we had to confirm it like twice because uh, it wasn't first obvious the first time. But uh, that shows, again, the power of a well-trained deep learning model. So again, you as a developer, you have in your power with the confidence score that we return, saying like, hey, this one, similarity of 90% is great for me. Or, OK, I probably need to, I can go lower because I want to get as much more data uh, that I want to expose, saying like, hey, these are the possible uh, set of persons who match this profile or so forth. The other final one is we also enable face recognition. So imagine you are trying to build like a cluster of faces working in your enterprise and you want to enable um, 
authentication of like what are all the images. Or imagine you're building like a uh, photo application where you want to actually enable uh, searching of all the photos uh, of a particular uh, person. For instance, I can search in prime photos all the photos of my daughter. So, and I can do that, again, prime photos uses recognition so that it uses a uh, deep learning model to build an index of all the faces so that you can actually search for what are all the faces, uh, photos that contain the faces of a given person. So again, the philosophy behind recognition is uh, same as other services, high quality, best in class, deep learning services, built to be extremely scalable and easy to use. When you talk about easy to use, one of the things we have done is we have integrated with S3 where you drop an image in an S3 bucket, we automatically trigger an event that triggers a Lambda function which you can configure to call recognition so that you generate these tags and you can store those tags in DynamoDB. Think about it, you don't have to run a single infrastructure. Now you can enable visual search in a serverless fashion on top of it. So with that, uh, so these are the summary of uh, Amazon AI uh, services. But then it would be super interesting for you to hear from like what, uh, how our customers are actually using these AI services. And I'm very excited to welcome Dan Law, who is our new Sharif in town and chief data scientist for Motorola Solutions. Welcome, Dan. Two weeks before this or that. And they're like, do you want to throw it? Uh, thanks, Swami. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, as Swami mentioned, my name is Dan Law. Uh, I'm not a policeman. Um, I lead data analytics at Motorola Solutions. I'm joined here on stage uh, by my colleague, Wei Lin, who's in our data analytics team. Uh, we're very happy to be here as part of this mini-con. Okay, uh, at Motorola Solutions, we build mission-critical communications solutions and services. These help our public safety and commercial customers build safer cities and thriving communities. More than half of our customers work in public safety. We provide police officers with technologies that help keep them safe. These include software, services, and devices like radios and body-worn cameras like you see I'm wearing here. What I want to talk about today is how AI, artificial intelligence, can benefit public safety. We're going to look at a missing person scenario and we're going to see how these three new AI capabilities released today uh, can be applied to address this heartbreaking problem. It's a sobering fact that in the United States, there are approximately 100,000 active missing persons cases at any given time. That's, that's three times the number of people as we have at this, at this conference, missing. About 60% are adults and 40% are children. Now the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NamUs, for example, lists about 13,000 open missing persons cases in its registry. This is sadly very close to the number of unidentified remains cases which are tracked using the same system. The point is, when an incident occurs, when someone goes missing, our customers have to deploy resources to find them as quickly as possible. So how do we currently do this? Our customers work hard using human-oriented processes and tools. These span from the start of an incident, or call for service, 911, through tasking, dispatch, and investigations. For a missing person, this may start with a focused search. But if that fails, commanders may broadcast descriptions of missing persons for their officers to be on the lookout for, which is also called a, a BOLO. Now at Motorola, we build software and devices to support these workflow and communication needs. In fact, many of them are running on Amazon GovCloud. But the point is, humans perform the primary cognitive functions at each step. So the question is, can AI augment this scenario? Well, yes, it can. With computer vision flavors of AI, we can turn our body-worn cameras and fixed cameras into sensors that continually monitor their environments 
to look out for missing people. With natural language understanding and generation aspects of AI, we can help our customers keep their eyes up and their hands free so they can always access critical information without becoming distracted as they would be with traditional web-based forms or, or apps. Now, as we, as we just heard, Amazon Recognition, Amazon Lex, and Polly can help support this, and it can do so in a way that respects privacy and security requirements. So what I'd like to do is illustrate this scenario in a video and a demonstration. So the video I'm about to show shows how voice interaction and facial recognition can be applied to find a missing person in a mobile environment. So now that we've seen the concept in a video, I want to demonstrate the basic steps. We have a scenario where we have a missing person, a virtual missing person, my colleague Wei. Uh, Wei's face is in a database of virtual missing people. Um, and um, I also have mounted on my chest here a Motorola Solutions device that combines a uh, radio speaker microphone with a body-worn camera. Now we created some software that's running on this device that can identify faces and pass them to recognition. Um, actually, can we switch to screen three, please? I want you to see an application. Uh, computer three, please. Thank you. OK, so what you see on the screen here is, a, is an application, a mobile app that displays a timeline of activities and events. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my body cam. Okay, so now this is on, it should start viewing its environment and it should be able to see faces. I'm gonna try and face my, my colleague Wei. And if there is a match for a missing person named Wei Lin with the following description, 35 year old Asian American male. So as, as you could hear and see, the device was able to spot and recognize Wei uh, which triggered um, an activity. It triggered an activity that's reported in the Timeline app and triggered the voice alert via Polly that you just heard. Um, so you can imagine that this can trigger other activities as well, such as uh, uh, alerting other officers in the area to come to my help. Uh, also, um, so j basically we, we wanted to get AI on the device to find missing people, and that's what it did. It found a missing person on its own. So in this scenario, Unfortunately, I'm not able to approach Wei in time, and he gets into a vehicle. So can I look at that vehicle without losing it from my sight? I can if I can ask my device to um, look up the plate for me. Look up plate 6, Fox, 7, 9, Bravo. 6, Fox, 7, 9, Bravo matches red 2010 Chrysler LeBaron. Auto is Arena Malukova at 41 to 2536 Street, LIC, New York 11101. No outstanding. No priors. Check vehicle owner. Arena Malukova, male, white, 25 years old. Last known residence at 41 to 2536 Street, LIC, New York 11101. So as you can see, the capability works, and, and no humans were burdened on the other end. So how does this all work? Actually, can we go back to um, the slides, please? Computer one. 
So uh, for the recognition part of the demo, as I mentioned, we wrote code that's running on our device that can identify faces in the real-time video feeds. Now, the faces are extracted by the code and synchronized to the cloud through our intel intelligent middleware services uh, using CouchDB. We have microservices running in EC2 that pick up these ad facial identification events and pass faces to the recognition API. When there's a match, this triggers a recognition event that is picked up by the timeline app and the poly service to generate the update to the timeline that you saw and to generate the voice alert via poly that we just heard. Now, a note on privacy and security. At no time is a face stored on disk and at no time is a face accessible by a human unless there's a match. All unmatched faces are deleted without a trace. Also, our operational services run on Amazon's GovCloud, which enforces compliance with our customers' stringent and important security requirements. Now, the voice aspect of the demo is similar. In an operational scenario, our voice utterances would be synchronized, again, through our middleware and data platforms. But in this case, we're actually using uh, Amazon Lex's Android SDK to communicate directly with the Lex API. So my voice utterances are passed up uh, to Lex, which extracts intents, and those intents run through Lambda functions. Lambda functions will execute queries off of our APIs and our data platform. Um, so that's basically how we, we leverage these three new capabilities uh, to address this uh, missing person scenario. Um, and thanks for your time, and um, thanks to Amazon for releasing these new powerful capabilities. Very exciting, very exciting. Well, it's so exciting to see how a customer is able to put all these things together to actually do a real world scenario where, I mean, something like public safety, missing person actually, where it can be deployed. This is uh, such an interesting thing. The next customer I'd uh, like to welcome is Salil. Uh, Salil from Ohio Health. Uh, here he's going to talk about how you can actually use these AI services to make the experience of healthcare for a customer actually a lot easier. Welcome, Salim. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Swami. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit about Ohio Health, just, just very quickly, by the numbers here. Uh, we're, a, we're a very large healthcare system based in central Ohio. Uh, about a dozen hospitals, hundreds of physician practices, dozens of ambulatory sites, um, and lots of other uh, supplementary business units focused on healthcare. We're a healthcare company. Um, a little bit more detail, just to make sure everyone has sort of an understanding of who we are and how we're rated. Uh, among the healthcare systems nationally, we're, we're definitely top rated by some of the quality metrics that healthcare is measured by. Um, and so that's just a little bit about, about us. Can we switch to two, please? So I want to build some, uh, some quick appreciation for the value of the tools that AWS has provided and how that can impact healthcare. For us and the development shops that we run, our goal is to change healthcare from the inside out. So by a show of hands, if you can think of the absolute best customer experience you've ever had, uh, I'd like to know, just does everyone have an absolutely amazing customer experience, whether in retail or sort of in any sector, in any industry? How many people have had an amazing customer experience in the past? All right, now what I'd like for you to do, keep your hand up if you, if you would please, if you had just an incredible experience uh, dealing with any industry, automotive, retail, banking. Um, keep your hand up if that experience was in healthcare. Okay, that's what I thought. So that's, that's our goal and we're here to change that. Uh, AWS um, and some of these new features that have been deployed like Lex and Poly are what we've utilized uh, to make that change. So I wanna show that to you now. Um, This is, our, this is our mobile app. It has all of the requisite cool features that the modern healthcare customer would expect out of a, of a mobile app. Uh, the ability to find a physician, uh, view our real-time urgent care wait time so you can make an informed decision about where you want to go, notifications from your doctor. I want to show you how we've incorporated Lex into I that. I feel well. Sorry to hear that. Do you have a fever? No. Are you experiencing pain? No. Are you experiencing nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea? No. Based on your symptoms, I think you should schedule an appointment with your doctor. 
Would you like me to schedule an appointment with your primary care provider in your profile? Dr. Jones? Yes. Okay. Based on your calendar availability and your scheduling preferences, I have scheduled an appointment with Dr. Jones for next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Your calendar has been updated. So that's a relatively simple workflow that we work through. Uh, again, I, what I'll probably offer out in advance for our, for our friends in the business prevention units, uh, our risk teams, um, this is absolutely a mock-up. It's a demo of what could be possible. There's lots of regulatory issues, HIPAA-type considerations to get through. But we want to show what's possible given some of these tool sets and the intersection of our digital properties. That's just an easy customer engagement way uh, to, to incorporate common features and functions of a mobile app with the needs of a, a healthcare customer through primary care, right? Sort of those lower acuity symptoms uh, that you like to get seen for. Um, lots of data dips into automated scheduling. We intimate, obviously, the connection to your, to your patient uh, portal so that we can look up in advance your favorite physician, your favorite location, things like that. Let's take it down a slightly more complicated path. I feel sick. Sorry to hear that. Do you have a fever? Yes. Is your temperature above 103 degrees Fahrenheit? Yes. Based on your symptoms, I think you should go to an urgent care. Can I assist you in finding an urgent care? Yes. I've found some nearby urgent care centers at Dublin Urgent Care, Grandview Urgent Care, and Hilliard Urgent Care. I am now directing you to one. So. That's a slightly more complicated example where the symptoms and the acuity for the responses that you're providing Lex, those, those gaps that Lex needs to fill in to figure out what's the appropriate path to take for you clinically, kind of guides that decision path down a different place. It also demonstrates the interactivity that we can pass back from those Lambda functions to our app to actually incorporate some automation in the app and show you what needs to happen next and bring those results to you within a native mobile app setting. Um, so that's, that's sort of a more robust example, um, but let's complicate it even more. Um, one of the things to appreciate is that for healthcare providers, it's relatively easy to get in the game of online scheduling for primary care when it's kind of basic common symptoms like, you know, cold, flu, things like that that we're all used to. But what about specialty areas? What about those complications for chronic disease patients, those with uh, cardiac condition or diabetes uh, or COPD, those are less easy to schedule online and build uh, an audience for, but they, those are customers nonetheless for us, and we want the same level of deep engagement for them as we do for every other customer that's utilizing primary care. The risk in dealing with that in healthcare is that we have to be able to weed out emergent cases. And that's to say, you don't want someone that's going into cardiac arrest trying to schedule an online appointment through the app. That's not what we want. We want them to get to 911. So we've built capability through our protocol that demonstrates how we can guide them and filter out those emergent cases and really only get to the subset of people that we want to use these engagement tools. So let me show you that. I'm having chest pain. Sorry to hear that. Is your chest pain occurring during rest? Yes. I think it is time to go to an emergency room. Can I help you? Yes. I've found some nearby emergency rooms at Doctors Hospital, Dublin Methodist Hospital, and Riverside Methodist Hospital. I am now directing you to one. So that's a better example of how we can weed out those emergent cases and direct a patient to the right place so that we're not spending time taking on undue risk and putting that patient at risk either. The last scenario that I'd like to show you is probably the most complicated. Um, and what I will say about this is that it's very easy in this platform and these tools to get caught up in the speech recognition and the natural language processing piece of that. But this is machine learning. So we want to demonstrate the value of that um, through some of the functionality we've built. For that purpose, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the actual protocol workflow that we built before we ever built anything into Lex so you can appreciate what's really happening behind the scenes.
My chest hurts. Sorry to hear that. Is your chest pain occurring during rest? No. Does the pain get worse with exertion? No. Do you have a history of coronary artery disease? No. Okay. Can I ask you a few more questions? Yes. Are you 65 or older? No. Are you 45 or older? No. Are you male? Yes. Do you have diabetes? No. Do you use tobacco products? No. Do you have high blood pressure or are you on medication for high blood pressure? No. Do you have high cholesterol or are you taking medication for high cholesterol? Yes. Based on your answers, I think that you should schedule an appointment with a cardiologist. Can I help you? Yes. Okay. Based on your calendar availability and your scheduling preferences, I have scheduled an appointment with a cardiologist, Dr. Hart, for next Friday at 1 p.m. Your calendar has been updated. That is uh, a more complicated workflow, and what that really demonstrates, if you look at that box around the risk assessment, is that uh, in the clinical space, that's what our physicians are doing. When you're being bombarded with that litany of irritating questions, uh, we're taking that down in, in your electronic medical record and calculating risk assessment to figure out where should we send you and what do we need to do with you. We can, we can offload that work, right? We can offload those questions. Not only can we pepper you with the Q&A that's requisite for healthcare, we capture that data. We can write it into your EMR for the benefit of you for later uh, use. We can capture it for the benefit of the physician so that they don't have to ask those questions. The follow-up visit, we can just say, are these answers still correct or do we need to change any of these? So there's a real powerful uh, application for machine learning that we can utilize. The entire workflow that we show here for cardiac patients uh, and the cardiology discipline seems complicated. It's probably the most simple that we can show in a subspecialty area. So that really demonstrates the power of Lex uh, and the AWS tools that we can utilize. What you're looking at is one of approximately, we're, we're intimating around 30 different workflows that are predefined protocols in healthcare that we know of to guide you as a patient to where you need to go. Those 30 protocols that are very much diagrammable represent more than 50% of all uh, physician appointments across all types. So if we can diagram this and 29 others, we can bring customer engagement, digital customer engagement for healthcare through automated tools like Lex um, up uh, to, to a more available standard. And that's kind of how we see the power of the, the platform to reshape the industry for healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of potential. For us, um, in terms of the value of AWS, there's two things that I'd like to say about that. The speed at which we were able to develop some of these tools and these platforms is a little bit breakneck compared to other emerging technology prototypes that we have built in explorations. Uh, this took us easily weeks, if not maybe just a couple of months, whereas we still have projects back at home that started well in advance of this in other R&D areas that are still not off the ground because of infrastructure problems, because our development platforms and con configurations take considerably longer to spin up. So that's power number one. Number two, the extraordinary value of this is the portability uh, into the Lex platform. All of the code that we wrote, everything that we've created is very much reusable, and that's intensely important to a resource manager. That if we write code once, we don't want to dispense with that code. We want to reuse it. This makes it uh, so we have a portable environment in which to reuse and then augment it with additional Lambda functions, web services, calls, things like that that we've utilized in the past. So it's a great opportunity. We're really thankful in our partners at AWS. Thank you for your time. Cool. Cool. Thanks a lot, Salu. Um, so really appreciate everyone coming over. So we have a whole number of sessions on all the new services in the AI mini conference today. They were all just announced. Uh, check your map. If you have any questions, we'll be here offline or uh, so forth. We'll be happy to take them um, as you go along. Cool. Thanks a lot, everyone.